I'd like to greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Are you okay? Amen. I pray that you are well and that God is keeping you. I'm not only greeting uh, the church in the building, but I know that there's a church following us online. And we also want to greet that congregation as well that is following us on Facebook and other platforms um, in the name of Jesus Christ. We are reading the book of Proverbs chapter 31. And we're going to start reading from verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. So he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like a match the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her maid servants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profits, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hand to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Amen. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, in the name of Jesus and Jesus alone, the only name given on earth through which we can access divine power. In this name on which we believe and have placed our lives, we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that he may give us understanding for the scriptures, but not only that. You see, dear Jesus, it is not just understanding we need. It is the power to obey and do. So, Father, when we have understood the word, grant us unlimited power to actually practice it in our lives. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I want to speak about a challenge that is now rising quite strongly within our families. It is the challenge of relating to each other as husbands and wives when there is a change in our financial status. And I want to address this not only for current husbands and wives, but I need to speak to all the boyfriends and girlfriends in the building and those who are watching, those who intend to get married one day. Because if we are going to change the current status of families, we need to not only heal the current families, but we need to produce better young men and women so that they do not repeat the mistakes that we have made. Are we together? I want to speak about weak women and fragile men. That is what I am talking about. Weak women and fragile men. And I will go to other verses, other those that we have read, but this will be the foundation of where we will be. Before I can speak about the relationship about 
men and women where money is concerned. I need to first address the problem of attitude towards each genders. Because you see, by the time we need to deal with money and wealth between males and females, we are dealing with an application which will go very wrong very badly if the theology of gender is first not corrected. Understand me very well. You cannot run your home higher than your theology about each other. And when I use the word theology, I use it not in the technical academic sense. I use it where it means your biblical beliefs about each other's gender. You see, my brothers and sisters, you can only treat your wife according to the verses you choose to read about women. And you can only treat your husband according to the verses you choose to read about men. And when your theology of interpretation is wrong there, the whole application no longer makes sense. Because the foundational interpretation is wrong. So, to put each other on the right path, we need to first go to where the issues start. In Genesis 1 verse 26, 27, and 28, God speaking says, let us make man in our likeness. Are we together? And then he continues and says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the beasts of the land, over every creeping creature that is out there. And when he finishes his statement, the Bible then says, so he made them, male and female. He created them in his own image. In his own image, he created them, male and female. And that is important because what follows will confuse you if you did not read these verses properly. In Genesis 2, verse 18, he then says, now we are being brought, zooming into that process of the making. He says, he makes Adam first. Then he says, it is not good for a man to be alone. I shall create a helper suitable for him. Then he puts Adam to sleep and makes Eve. Right there is the problem. Because many of us, when we read that God made Adam first and Eve after, we assumed the male is more important than the female. But we ignored verse 26 and 27 of chapter 1, where both genders appear and are called his image. Remember, the story of men and women doesn't start in chapter 2. He starts in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, he does not call Adam only the image. All right? In chapter 1, he calls both of them the image. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Listen to plurals. Let them, not him. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth 
and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. So, the first thing we need to understand here is that heaven's design has no superior agenda. I want you to decide whether your homes are run by Jesus or by culture. Remember, I warned you on day one. Whether you are here to hear your cultural affirmations or the word of God. Now, in chapter two, he creates them both. When he makes Adam and Eve after, that does not make Eve an afterthought. Why? We've met Eve in chapter one. We now know that the original design of the image of God has a he and a she. Are we together? So why chapter two? The Bible says, God says to Adam, here are all the beasts that I have made. Give them names. Adam begins to give them names. Then the Bible says, but as Adam counts and gives names to animals, they all are many. But for Adam, there was no one like him. Pay attention. At no point does the Bible say Adam is lonely. Never does the Bible say, then Adam asked God, where's my wife? Adam can't ask for a wife. The concept of a wife does not exist in his mind. He is the first human being. He doesn't know that there's a possibility of anything called female. As far as he knows, may all humans will look like him. And he doesn't know that there is love or sexuality. None of those things are in his mind. Why? He hasn't been instructed to do them. Make sense? So at no point is Adam sitting there thinking, oh, look at all these animals that are uh, 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 in twos and threes and fours and tens and twenties. No one has told him he needs somebody. That is why it's not him who asked. It's God who says it is not good for a man to be. Because God is fulfilling his own plan according to Genesis 1. His plan says there has to be somebody else. Are we together? Now he brings the female on board. He puts Adam to sleep and takes out a rib and makes the female. Now the female exists. Okay? God makes Eve somewhere. We know he made her away from Adam. Because the Bible says, then he brought her to the man. Remember, he put the man to sleep and took out a rib. Which means by the time the man woke up, God was no longer there. He was elsewhere making the woman. Now the woman has been made and God brings her to the man. And, and, and God says, uh, Adam meet Eve, Eve meet Adam. All right? Eve keeps quiet. Adam breaks in a poem. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she will be the mother of the living. Why would Adam just know this woman and love her? Because of Genesis 1, verse 26, 27, and 28. He is bound to know who she is because the image of God is him and her. Don't forget Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. In the image of God, he made them male and female. He created them. This couple knew nothing about superiority and inferiority in the perfect world. The problem came when they disobeyed. And they ate. Now God punishes them. He says, you, Adam... You will have to eat from the sweat of your brow. The earth will turn against you and resist your labor, making your labor much harder. And he turns to the woman and he says, because you obeyed the snake, two things will happen. Now your desire shall be after your husband and you shall give birth in pain. Okay? This is the case. This is the curse. And the curse is the second problem. Because there are many men and women 
whose relationship is based on the curse, not on Genesis 1. Most marriages here are curse operating, not original plan operating. Remember, in the perfect world, the man had no authority over his wife. Please understand, any power a man has over a woman was the gift of sin, not of God. Not. While the world was perfect, no line, not even one, gave Adam any advantage over Eve. So when a man enjoys authority over a woman, he is reaping the fruits of sin, not of righteousness. Because righteousness never gave such authority. It was the arrival of sin that made that provision. Jim and come back. We can spend cover to cover. The only time when we as men began to have authority over women was when sin arrived. Prior to that, they had been instructed the same instruction as us. Listen, I'm, I'm going to read it again. <laughs> Verse 28, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Who must be fruitful and multiply? Them. Fill the earth and subdue it. Who has the right to subdue? Them. Yeah? Have dominion. Who must have dominion? Them. Over the sea, birds of the air, every living thing that moves on the earth. Nowhere did here God disperse this authority to Adam and say, When I get Eve, as Adam does these powerful things, you will obey, yeah? When sin arrives, yes, there's a curse. Now walk with me. That authority of the curse expires when Jesus dies for us. Because now Jesus says, whomsoever the son of man sets free, he is free indeed. All these things that sin came with are in two stages. Remember, the two things that Jesus is addressing, there are those he gives us power over right now and those he will reverse at the second coming. Yeah? For example, we still die, but we are no longer afraid. At the second coming, it gets addressed. But there are things we don't have to wait for. When he teaches Israel, whatsoever you ask for in my name, the Father will give to you. Huh? He teaches us love. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. What is Jesus doing? He is teaching us to begin practicing the original contract of Eden on human relationships. Not based now on the curse, but based on what God had originally wanted. Relationships governed by love. Love that recognizes equality. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So under the contract of righteousness, the question is, are you doing to your wife what you would have done unto you? Are you doing to your husband what you would have done unto you? Because now, Jesus answers it. Remember when they thought they were confused about who is my neighbor, and he tells them the story of a good Samaritan. To emphasize that the kingdom of God sees no one through the spectacles of sin anymore. When you are in Christ, you will be governed by love. And that love will say to you, if I am going to do it to him or to her, I must be willing to have it done to me. Now, who's your greatest neighbor other than the one who sleeps in the same bed as you? There's no neighbor that is closer than that one. Which means if there is anyone who deserves to be treated equally with love, it begins on the bed. Before you can practice it on the other neighbors and your siblings, begins here. So let me be very clear. What I am teaching is an offense to you if you are comfortable under a marriage of a curse. Now you'll have to choose 
whether the curse gives you more comfort than righteousness. But it is not for me to decide for you. But I can assure you when you get home, you'll have to decide. Is this marriage governed by the benefits of sin or by the benefits of redemption? The Israelites, like all cultures, for the men of Israel to operate with their wives on a curse was a blessing. It gave them power. It gave them power. That's why they were disappointed when Jesus came, when they came to Jesus to ask him about divorce. Uh, uh, it's just that I don't have enough time with you. I would have preached on that text where Jesus talks about divorcing. And I would have showed you how powerful the message of Jesus Christ is in it. Because the conclusion for Jesus is divorce only happens when you are greedy. And what is funny is he doesn't put it on the side of women. He puts the greed on men. Because remember, at that time, women had no rights. Only a man could file for divorce. So a woman can never be guilty of divorcing. And if she's not guilty of divorcing, then she's not guilty of greed. But let's walk together. The men of Israel don't see a problem. They love it. They love the authority that comes with the curse. Makes sense. It has given them power. They are where it goes. And then a number of things begin to happen where God begins to display clearly he disapproves of this authority through the curse. Numbers 27. A man has died and only had four daughters. His name is Zelophehad. Their father was rich, but they will gain nothing. All property is now going to their uncles. Are we together? They are father's brothers. So these girls come to Moses and say, our father died, but he had no son. Now we will lose everything. Initially, Moses doesn't see a problem. He's a typical Israelite male. He says, of course, such is the law. And these girls say, but the law is not right. Mm -hmm. Moses goes to the tent of meeting and tells God the case. And God says, these girls are correct. Mm -hmm. And God makes one of the most profound rulings mm -hmm. on gender. Mm -hmm. More powerful than any constitutional court on earth could make. Mm -hmm. He says, here's my ruling. Females can inherit property from their fathers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to be married. Mm -hmm. They can inherit on their own rights. Mm -hmm. God takes it further. He says, however, because you are my people, and I don't want your inheritance to be lost to other nations, should a female who inherited from her father seek to marry, she can't do it outside of her tribe. So that you don't lose the wealth. But if she never wants to marry, that's okay. It's still her property. This was a profound judgment. Because up to this point, women could inherit nothing. And it's not an old thing. I know that some among you here have not written your daughters in your wills. Because you think she will get married go to another family, and then they will spend your money. You are being unbiblical. <laughs> In the Bible, your daughter deserves inheritance as her brothers. And the Bible says, if you are worried about another family taking over your inheritance, you see what God said to the Israelites then? We can also do today. We can leave inheritance in a trust. And that trust has a specific clause that whomever you marry, these assets shall not form community of property. So there is nothing that prevents daughters from inheriting. Put a clause. Put a clause. And courts don't change those clauses. They will simply say to your daughter, if you are passionate about sharing these assets with your husband, you will have to forfeit them. 
Because the clause your parents put in there was that when you get married to preserve these, they cannot form part of your marital community of property. Now, what does that mean? It's very powerful. It means your daughter's children can also inherit. But also when they get married, their spouses shall be excluded. In this way, your wealth goes down only through the generations that are in your bloodline. White people have been using these things for hundreds of years. Why do you think they've got so much generational wealth? But the point I'm making is, therefore, to look down on a woman's ability to inherit is dispelled by the kingdom of God. We must just be clear. So that's why, again, I'll remind you, when we started, I asked you, are you running families under Jesus or under something else? Because I don't care about your culture. You can't say to me, but pastor, in our culture, a woman cannot. That is a question I'm not prepared to entertain. Is Christ having authority or not? Because if your family is being run through the word of God, then your culture must just stand out there. The word of God must dictate what must happen. And the word of God says women inherit and don't need a man to back them up. This law was powerful because it changed the financial status of Israelite women. Now that they inherited on their own, they could get married not needing to depend on a man. Oh, God had done something powerful. Girls could now get married and they are here for genuine love, not for your income. She's bringing her father's land, her father's cattle, his properties. So when she says, I love you, she is not here for the pay slip. And I'll show you that it was a powerful thing. Because suddenly, you now come across women in the Bible who were wealthy and owned assets. But here's what I'm going to show you. Now begins the weak women aspect. Because what I want to demonstrate is that this idea of women today that when I have money, I don't have to respect a man. There are two ideas I want to crush from you ladies. One is the idea that I have money, I don't have to respect a man. The other is the idea that a man must take care of me. Weak and lazy. Let me show you a case of a wealthy woman whose respect for her husband is unquestionable. When you go and read your Bible in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 to 37, there's a story there of a couple. The lady is just known as the Shunammite woman. Whenever Elisha was traveling, he would stop at their house to sleep. Are you with me? Listen to this. This wealthy lady says, doesn't say, I'm going to build a room for the prophet to sleep here. The Bible says she went to her husband and said, my husband, the man of God passes our house every day. Surely we can do something. And together they say, we will build him an upper room. When a woman has money and disrespects her husband, it's her stupidity. There is nowhere in the Bible where it says a wealthy woman no longer respects her husband. So if you are married and your wife disrespects you because she's making more money, you married a fool. Money is not the problem, it's the fool you chose. So you can't as a man be angry with women that have money. No, 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 no. God long ruled women can have money. The problem is your fool, the one in your house. You chose badly. This one thinks money gives her authority over her husband. What is she doing? She is reversing the curse. But it's still a curse relationship. Here we've got a very successful woman. And we know she's successful because when Elisha eventually asks, sending Gehaz, go ask her, what can we do for them? For this kindness. Huh? She explains, oh my Lord, I need Nothing. I lack 
nothing. I live among my own people and have prospered with them. But she never says to her husband, listen here you, we are buying that car. If you can't afford it, not my problem, I've got my own money. I want to say to all the men out there, don't develop attitude to women with money, deal with your fool. Women with money are not the problem, it's this one you paid Lobola for. You should have checked with a psychologist if everything is fine. Because what has resulted now are men who have a huge attitude against successful women. Firstly, to have an attitude against successful women is to have an attitude against God. Because it is God who made the ruling that women can be rich. So your problem is not even with women, it's God himself. Because this ruling came from the highest court in the universe. So it's not optional. It's not optional whether women can be rich or not. It's a divine order. So my fellow sisters who are doing well, who are earning more than your husbands, and you think you are something big, you are sick. You are sick. Money is not the problem. Money gave you the environment to reveal your diseases. You have mental issues. Let's not blame money. You are just not well. You need help. But there are many women who are very successful, earning more than their husbands, and still the husband is respected. Even when they speak, they speak in we and us, never I. You, you could buy a house and she puts 60% of the budget. When the family comes, yeah? she says, we have bought a home. Ubaba will deliver the speech of thanksgiving. <laughs> Only the fool goes around saying, 80% of the money is me. Then there's the second group, a man must. A man must take care of me. A man must buy my car. A man must buy me a house. Weak. You refuse to face God and to challenge him to give you blessings based on your own creativity. You hide behind a man. It might excite you to sit on a passenger seat of a land cruiser. But as far as God's plans are concerned, you could have sat on the driver's seat on your own. See, so many women will never know how much God loved and had gifted them because they are busy over praising being taken care of. Listen. If God had no plan for women, men would be the only creature on the planet. Then he would know he's just dealing with one professional species. <laughs> you are here Mind you, you and your husband were not born from the same womb. Clearly a sign God had two different plans. And being married does not mean a woman must now relax and stop pursuing dreams. No, you will be accountable to God on the day you die. What did you do with the skills and the talents he put in you? And I'm not saying if a woman decides to be a stay-at-home wife, that is wrong. I am saying you should not be a stay-at-home wife as a default of laziness or lack of resources or opportunities. It should be an informed choice. One that comes from having pursued your dreams and realized, okay, now I want to pack it. I want to focus on my children. These are two different things. Some ladies are doing nothing to develop themselves, looking to the men. Looking to the men. Part of the reason then you make yourselves, hear me very well. Women who perpetuate this stereotype that a man must take care of you are the ones who are the fuel behind the abusive men who deny women opportunities. Because as long as you are hungry for a man who takes care of you, there'll always be a man who believes women should not work. Because you are feeding each other in this vicious cycle. 
The Bible is clear. Eve also had to be fruitful. It wasn't Adam's duty only. Eve also had to multiply. Problem is when you read that verse, you only stop at children. Be fruitful and multiply. Then that's what you want. You just want to see the yard full. But when you ask the Jews how they understand it, they say children are only one aspect. You must multiply. Oh, now that leads me to something very difficult. <laughs> Multiplication was commanded on Adam and Eve. What does that mean? It means a married couple has a duty to develop a multiplying strategy for the family. And both of you must work on it because not one person was commanded. Both of you. So you must sit and ask, how is this family going to multiply? What's my role? What's your role? Hey. Can't be, no, my wife, your role will be to have children. What do you mean? Okay. We are equal participants in the making. I'm already there. You are there. So we need to speak bigger on multiplication. What else? What else can we do to multiply the family? If you want to be taken care of by a man, that's okay. But I just want to inform you, it's a reflection of laziness. God could have achieved more through you and for you. He has always been willing. And by the time you get married, you would not have gotten married for someone to take care of you. But the problem you see is even in the language of the parents. Let me tell you where the problem is. As a boy growing up in the house, when I don't clean after myself, the, the statement is, why are you not picking up your own things? You're such a lazy boy. When a girl doesn't, they say, who will marry you? You see, that language already informs girls. They are not in this world to achieve anything, but to wait to be married. So growing up, a girl doesn't have to fight for her career. I'm looking for a man. Because someone must marry me. Yeah? Some of you girls say it when you graduate. I hope this is my first and last degree. Because this school thing, I just need someone to take care of me. And again, hear me very well. I don't have a problem with you being married to someone who can spoil you. But not from a disadvantage that you have nothing. But from a respect of who you are. Those are two different things. Don't, don't have a husband who spoils you. Because without him you are nothing. Let him spoil you. Because when he sits and looks, you moving up and down the house, he says to himself, what prayer did I pray to God to be blessed in such a way? Then he gets up, he goes to food lovers, picks bunches of roses, eh? lilies, and comes home and says, these are for you. And when you ask, what did I do? And he says, just for existing in my life. But it is difficult to gift someone who always asks you for money. Because as soon as they open their mouth, you know. Oh, Lord Jesus, what did I do? What did I get myself into? I know we are Adventists. We don't do Valentine's. Eh? You are holy people. But I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to make the example anyway. You know, it's why, for example, that is why, for example, men, men don't look forward to Valentine's and birthdays. Because we have to fund ourselves. Because this person in the house has no plan. You have to find a way to give them extra money so that they go buy you a gift. And then you still have to smile and like, oh, oh, lovely. At the back of your mind, you are thinking, my money. What is <laughs> you see, when you are a man who is married to an empowered woman and your relationship is full of trust, you don't need to monitor every cent. Yeah. Because you know, even the cents I know nothing about, they are working for our interest. Yeah. I wish we had husbands like that. Hide money for the joy of the family, not girlfriends. When your wife realizes you didn't declare everything and she smiles, she knows something good is coming. It's not hidden for girlfriends. She knows Easter holidays are around the corner. 
he will surprise and say, meet me at the airport. Bring the kids and the passports. Now you see, in a situation like that, you don't need to worry about the rents and cents and dollars you don't know about. Because you know where they work, they work for the good of this family. Now we return to Proverbs 31, where we started. That my problem with Proverbs 31 is that, one, it has not been read. Two, when read, it has not been given its analytical value. You see, this is about a wife, but I'm going to show you the husband that appears in the story so that you understand this couple. You see, when, when, when young people talk about couples' goals, Proverbs 31, this couple is goals. This is what you want to aim for when you have a relationship. So let's go through it. Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is about rubies. I won't dive into the backgrounds. You now know it's written to Solomon, written by his mother, Queen Bathsheba, advising him about uh, finding a truly virtuous woman. Okay, so for the sake of time, let me just get into it. Listen to where Queen Bathsheba begins. He says, this woman... The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so will, he will have no lack of gain. This lady is the custodian of her husband's heart. He trusts her completely, but listen to the language, so that he lacks no gain. In other words, this lady is committed to not being the reason he underperforms. He shouldn't lose anything because of her. Her goal is that when he goes out, she should be the engine that backs up his excellence. He must not suffer loss because of her. What does that mean? Let me tell you the gift God gave women. Women are multipliers. Whatever you give a woman... When you come back, it will be more. That is what he means. When this guy leaves things in his wife's hands, he doesn't have to glance for the second time. He knows it is safe. And when he returns, there will be gain, not loss. Continues. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. That one doesn't need an explanation. This lady has nothing in her that is planning evil for her husband. Zero. Some of you are planning to kill us for the inheritance, not this lady. Nothing about her is looking to harm him. No evil towards him. Are we together? Let's continue. What else is in this woman? Now here the story changes, and I now want to address fragile men. Because there are men whose manhood is so fragile, if a woman succeeds, it breaks. You know, there are men whose manhood has osteoporosis. The bones are weak. As soon as the woman in your life starts to plan to go higher, he palpitates, he has BP, he has a stress, and now it's fight and bitterness all over. Guys, we need to heal from fragile masculinity. You can be a man with a very successful wife. Just like I rebuked the ladies, you can be happily married, be successful, and still respect your husband. I must also rebuke us. Our manhood is not dependent on women being inferior. Watch this guy and his wife. The Bible says, who is this lady? Now listen. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and a portion for her servants. Now this part talks about her value at home. That this lady is on, on top of her family life. Are we still together? She is present. She can be felt at home. 
She's not missing. She's here. The family can feel her. Are we together? But can I show you something that many people miss? The Bible says here, she also provides a portion for her maid servants. Now we are being introduced to it. The lady has people who work for her. This is an industrious woman. So gentlemen, be very clear. The Bible praises women who are industrious. Now here's a very important line, verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. Oh, I love that line. She considers a field and buys it. Listen from what? From her profits, she plants a vineyard. Business-minded. This lady owns properties. She has farms. She has servants who harvest the farms, the vineyards. She is making wine and vinegar from the vineyards. She makes profits. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Is she a wife? Yes. Present at home? Yes. Felt at home? Yes. Serving her family? Yes. And still making a profit? Yes. Nowhere does the Bible say because she makes a profit, her family is now neglected. She gets herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. It's still f words of describing her productivity, her economic participation in the economy. Are we still together? She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed in scarlet. In other words, she also plans for the hard times. When she sees hard times coming, she plans so that her family is not in need. All right? He continues. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Now, this is an important line, ladies. Her clothing now, not what she sells. Her clothing is fine purple and linen. Let me be very clear. Stop dressing ugly and calling it holy. <laughs> you are dressed ugly. It's not holy. Remember, in these days, scarlet and purple were the most expensive colors because to produce them, they had to dive into the sea and find a particular seashell from which they could extract the ink. It was a deadly profession. So to afford a scarlet linen dress, and a purple robe was something else. In modern day language, lady got style. Lady don't just put no what's in the wardrobe. Lady care about her looks. You must stop this thing of uh, humiliating God and saying you are being humble. You are not humble, it's ugly. It's not humility, it's ugly. Now listen to this. Watch how this couple works. What has her husband been doing all along? Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. That's a very critical line. It's not addressing sitting as in you are lazy. In those days, men made decisions about the economy of the land on the city gates. That is where they would discuss the price of land, the price of cattle. That is where the men would trade. So listen to this. This guy sits where decisions are made. Remember, we were told before she buys land. So what is this guy doing? He influences the law of the land, knowing what his wife needs to do. He sits among decision makers for the economy. Then he comes home and he says, don't buy land yet. We are working on a project to decrease prices. Wait. Then he goes back to the gate. They negotiate. They put systems in place. When he, land is available, he comes says it's the right time, buy, buy now. This is the right time. What these guys are doing is they are hard workers, but their work complements each other. There is no competition in this house. There is complementing. He has skills which he uses in an environment that will make his wife's business easier to run. There's no jealousy here. There's no, you don't respect me anymore. They have deployed each other strategically. Are you with me? This is what we need today. A family of compliment, not competition. Where we look at each other's skills and we say, what can we do? What can we do? I was making an example, uh, having a chat with someone and saying, listen, 
Not everyone is business minded. Some people honestly love their desk profession, and that's okay. So suppose you're a woman, you're ambitious, you want business, but your husband loves being a corporate guy. That doesn't make him a weak man. Neither should he resign his job and join you. If he is not for business, he's not. Are you still with me? Yeah. But here's what he can do. He can say, listen, you have the mind of an entrepreneur. I have a corporate mind. Register your business. I will give you all my corporate skills, which you don't have. So while you are running around looking for clients, I will be setting out the structure of your company, your marketing, your labor, your HR. I will be making sure that the things I'm corporately trained on, you never get to suffer from. You don't have to pay consultants while I'm here. I'm a corporate guy. You love business. Go do your thing. I will be here setting up the right structures for you. And as the business grows, he might then leave that corporate for your corporate. Why? Why is it in Africa that we can't do that? All we see is a threat. It's, we are married, but we see each other as a threat. The Bible continues and says... She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies searches for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Men are dangerous with their fists. Women are dangerous with their tongues. But no one is worse. Both of you are being evil towards each other. Beating a woman is evil. Because some men don't know how to talk, ladies, your fast tongue is also evil. Kindness is the law of her mouth. But of course, she's also not married to a beater. She's married to a powerful supporter, a pursuer and influencer of the economy who uses his position to make her life easy. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Listen to his praise. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Then Bathsheba concludes a message to all the ladies. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. If only we would allow God to help us to set our manhood right, we would be amazed at what we would achieve with these wives as our allies, not enemies. Trust God, not your relatives who whisper poison, never trust a wife. This poison has destroyed Africa. Many men who could have achieved far greater heights by taking advice from the wife never did. Because there were relatives who keep saying, a wife who tells you what to do, she is controlling you. I can tell you right now, the wife God gave you, that lady can take you far. To the young men in this room, when your time to get married comes, do not fall into the stupidity of our generations and our forefathers. Trust your wives. Let God reveal their skills. And I promise you, like the man there in Proverbs 31, you will never lack. To the ladies in the house, God did not assign a man to take care of you. A man must take care of you out of love, not out of dependence. You have gifts. You have abilities. Go to the God who made you. 
Ask him to reveal what he put in you. And I pray, should you be married to a man who may not support your growth, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit goes ahead of you to soften his heart and show him that working together, you guys could achieve the impossible. Amen. 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 To those ladies who are successful, talk to us, pastors and therapists. If you think being rich means you should be disrespectful, come to us, you need help. There are things in you we need to address, okay? You are not okay. You are not a symbol of what an independent woman is. You are a picture of a sick woman. Come, let's help you. To those men whose manhood depends on women being weak, come, come, let's talk. Something in you is hurt. Something in you is broken. Let me tell you, my brothers and my sisters, counseling is not weakness. Amen. Amen. Some of you are wounded from childhood. You saw your father's cheating. You saw your mother's beating up. That's not small. That can affect you big time. And to ask someone to help you deal with it will produce a much stronger, healthier man or woman. Amen. I pray for the success of every couple here. I pray that you work as teams, not as enemies. I pray that where there has been mistrust and distrust, where there have been failures and disappointments, the Holy Spirit may soothe and heal you and help you find your way back to each other. Here's my prophecy. If every couple in Zimbabwe started to work together, you guys can change the economy of this country without even voting. The power that God would unleash from all of you as power couples would be enough to rewrite the story of the country even before parliament passes an act. Amen. But while you are divided, while you tell each other, never trust a woman, I never trust a man. Hide your money, a man will run away with it. Hide your money, a woman will run away with it. Then... It's not just the bad economic policies that are killing you. It's the couple divisions that are also cementing it at a house-to-house -house level. Let's rise to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I have already expressed the prayer that I have and you have been listening. It truly breaks my heart, Heavenly Father, to see the level of distrust abuse, lack of communication, and the enmity that exists between two people who sleep in the same bed in the same house. And I ask myself, Lord Jesus, how did we get here? To be brave enough to sleep literally with the enemy, to share a bed with someone you don't trust. How did our hearts become so cold and so dark? We need help, dear God. If there be any man here or listening to my voice or watching online who feels locked in a world of pain, anger, mistrust that he doesn't know how to communicate, Lord, send him help. I don't know how, but send him help. And lastly, I want to pray for every young girl and young man here. Lord, we need to break this cycle of abuse and mistrust and inferiority and insult and enmity. 
Lord, as a child's umbilical cord is cut, so also you need to cut the umbilical cord that connects our sons with our anger, our sons with our depression, our sons with our promiscuity, our sons with our abuse, our sons with materialism as a way of gaining respect. A new story has to be written. Because what we want is an Africa, an Adventist church, where young couples will get married, prosper together, trust each other, work together, strategize, give each other advice, discipline each other, show each other mistakes, and be able to listen without anger for years to come till you come in your clouds of glory. Thank you, Jesus, for listening when we pray. And I pray that these words may never depart from our minds and our spirits. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, to him who is able to present us faultless and blameless before the throne of grace, to the only true God, invisible and incorruptible, be honor and glory as you remove marriages of a curse and you plant marriages of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, let all who believe say amen. Oh, 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 oh,